Welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight, we're going to be doing scandium, an element that probably no one here has ever heard of. <laughs> There's one person who's heard of scandium. Excellent. So I hope everybody, did you all get your uh, collectible scandium card? Should have been on your seat. And uh, let me ask a couple questions here. How many people have been to After Dark before? Not just this After Dark, but every After Dark, any After Dark. Okay. And how many people have, well, here's another way to ask it. How many people have some of the other cards from previous After Dark, Everything Matters, Tales of the Periodic Table? Oh, there's a few of you out there. Excellent. We like repeat customers. For those of you who don't, you can sort of fill in your collection over there. I think the table has a few extra of the previous cards, except I believe we're out of carbon right now. S but you should have been here for carbon, you know, to really get carbon. It may appear in future editions of Everything Matters, though. So uh, I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. And uh, tonight, scandium is the subject material. And uh, scandium is uh, element 21. Let's zoom it out here. Uh, it's the 21st element in the periodic table. That 21 is really telling you how many protons are in the nucleus of scandium atoms. Every element has a unique number of protons in the nucleus, that tells you what element it is. So hydrogen is number one and helium is number two because it has two protons and so on. Scandium is the 21st element in the table. Uh, so that means we've had 21 everything matters tales from the periodic tables so far because we're doing them in order. Um, and scandium is an interesting element. And before I go actually into scandium, I want to go off on a little side trip because uh, a little historical side trip. Let's go back, 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 and take a look at, this is Dmitry Mendeleev, and he's the guy who kind of invented the modern periodic table of the elements. Um, and he did this uh, back in about 1869. He wrote down on his scrap of paper. He arranged elements, let's take a closer look at that. He arranged elements uh, in order of atomic weight, not atomic number. The atomic number is the protons. The atomic weight is kind of like protons plus neutrons plus electrons. Uh, and he decided to try and organize that table in a way that would put elements with similar properties in rows. Now, this would be kind of tilted 90 degrees to what we're used to in our normal periodic table with hydrogen over here and down here he has lithium and so on. Uh, let's just take a look at, it actually did get published in a German chemical uh, publication, so this is sort of an easier to read version of it. And actually let's just make that a lot easier to read. There we go. So this was uh, the way Mendeleev wrote it down originally. And there are some element names that might seem a little unfamiliar to you in there um, because the element, uh, you know there's no element J, but there actually is an element I, which is what we call it, iodine here. But you'll notice that there are some places where there are question marks. He didn't know that that element existed. He was able to maybe predict an element existed. Let's take this and translate it into the form that we're familiar with. Here's the form that we're familiar with. And these are the elements that Mendeleev who were around, that people knew about when Mendeleev was formulating this whole idea of organizing the elements. And he organized them in, well, in his, he had rows, but we have columns of elements that have similar properties. So these over here, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, those are all elements that have similar properties. They all kind of blow up when you throw them into water and they have one valence electron and things like that. They form chemical compounds very similarly. And this arrangement here was quite a revolution, but you'll notice that there are empty spots in that table. Well. Mendeleev didn't know anything about this row down here, so we'll, that's, that's our new row here, and we'll, we can t you'll see what's in there in just a moment. But there were some empty spots. There was a spot right here, and a spot right here, and a spot right here, and a spot right here that didn't have any known element. But this allowed him to try and predict the properties of those elements. Here's another arrangement in another book, and you'll notice that there are empty spots here. 
there's an empty spot right there. It didn't have an element, didn't know what it was. Gave it a name. It was called, they just re named it Eka Boron because it had the same kind of property as Boron would have. Or this one, empty spot, which they called Eka Aluminum. Or this empty spot, which they called Eka, Cilia, uh, Eka Silicon. And one more over here, that was Eka Manganese. Now, these are all elements that didn't exist at the time of Mendeleev, but from the properties of the elements around those, he was able to predict the properties of these elements. Um, and they were actually fairly quickly discovered. Uh, the Eka Boron, this one right here, was discovered only a few years after he invented the periodic table. In about 10 years later, in 1879, that's our element for the evening, scandium. And uh, these other ones, this, the Eka, uh, Eka aluminum was discovered uh, just a little bit later, 1875. That's gallium. We'll get to gallium in, in, in maybe a, a year or so. Gallium is a really cool element. Come back for gallium. Uh, this element here, Eka silicon, turned out to be an element called germanium. And way over here, this element was Eka manganese, wasn't actually discovered until 1937, and that was um, uh, technetium. And those are all, uh, oops, wrong button. <coughs> so there, th there are the names of those four elements. The Eka means one down from. So Eka boron, or scandium, was one element down from boron. <coughs> Eka aluminum, or uh, gallium, was one element away from uh, uh, aluminum, and so on. Uh, there are those four elements, scandium, gallium, germanium, and technetium. Uh, gallium, we'll get to those eventually, in, as in 10 months, uh, was named after the France, gallium, and uh, germanium, we'll never guess what country that was named after. And technetium, since it's artificially produced, um, the tech means artificial. Tech is artificial, and so the technetium was, is the, was one of the first artificially produced uh, elements. Okay, and there they are. We'll fill in the whole table here so you can see. The elements in that row, that column that scandium is in right here, are called D-block elements, but it not only includes scandium and yttrium, but also includes this uh, entire row down here. Scandium is just the sort of the top element in that row. Below scandium is yttrium. We'll get there. And that also connects to the entire row here. The uh, it starts off with lanthanum. And so this row, uh, actually, th these elements are ca also called uh, the lanthanide series, the lanthanides. Now, the historically, the lanthanides and, gallium and scandium specifically um, was first kind of discovered by this guy, Lars, uh, Lars Frederick Nilsson, and he discovered this in 1879, and he actually didn't discover the, me the metal. He discovered the oxide. He was studying a couple of elements, that a couple of minerals, rather. These minerals came from Scandinavia, uh, gadolinite and eusenite, and he was looking at the spectrum and he found new lines in the spectrum. Every element puts out its own pattern of lines, uh, and he found some, a new, some new patterns, and that new pattern was because of a new element, which, since the minerals came from Scandinavia, he called scandium. So those two elements, we'll, I'll, we'll look closer at those in just a moment, but the main source of scandium is a yet a third element that's uh, called thortvite. Thortvitite, sorry. Thortvitite, uh, do you see the chemical formula down here? It's a combination of scandium and yttrium silicate. Um, uh, is sort of our main source of, when we mine it, of scandium in the world. And uh, the primary source of scandium. It's um, kind of a grayish green, black, or gray in color normally. It was named after this guy here, Olas. Thortvite. The other two elements that we were, the other two minerals that we were uh, talking about, eusenite, is also kind of a mixture. You know, it's kind of a mixture of yttrium, scandium, cerium, uranium, and thorium. All those, all those second row elements, those two bottom rows in, in the uh, periodic table. Um, 
and this other one, gadolinite, cerium, lanthanum, neodymium, yttrium, um, and uh, mixed into some uh, with also a silicate mineral. Uh, these um, are fo are found in uh, Sweden, Norway, and also in the U.S., Texas, Colorado. So these elements are actually spread quite widely over the uh, surface of the Earth. Now the metal, scandium, was actually not purified. Here's a slide of scandium metal. was only first produced in 1937. So we're talking about a pretty modern element. And if you want to see this piece, this piece is right here. So if you want to come on up after and check this out, um, please don't take it out of the bag because this doesn't belong to me and I don't want to oxidize it. <coughs> but check it out. Uh, scandium is uh, kind of a yellowish tinted uh, metal. It's fairly light, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's not very common, however. It's the 32nd most abundant element in the universe, which is uh, it's in only th it's three millionths of a percent of the universe. It's not very common. Uh, if you look at it in the sun, you think it's about the same, and it is. It's, uh, it's about the 31st most common element in the sun. Uh, in meteorites, it's a little more common. It's about the 29th most common element in meteorites. In the crust of the Earth, it's the 31st most abundant element in the crust of the Earth. But if you move into the oceans, which we're going to hear about in the second part, in the oceans, it's the 58th most abundant element. It makes up one, it, one point, 150 billionths of the ocean, not very much of the ocean is scan uh, scandium, very little. And the last thing is we want to know is how much scandium is in us. Well, none. Scandium is not important to us at all. We could exist our entire lives as you have with no scandium in your bodies. It's made inside of uh, very large exploding stars. And it's made by burning oxygen, and silicon in very, very large, heavy stars at the very end of their lifetime as they're going supernova. Those stars, it takes a very high temperature to burn oxygen and silicon. The stars have to be like 2.7 to 3.5 billion degrees in the center of the star. So that only happens as the star is kind of exploding. When that happens, Scandium is produced and lots of different isotopes. And isotopes are produced by uh, in those stars. What's an isotope? They're all scandium, which means they all have 21 protons in the nucleus. But they can have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. And this number you see next to the all the scandium symbols from 36 to 60, 25 different isotopes, that's the total number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. However, there's only one stable isotope of scandium, which is scandium-45, which means, if you're looking at abundances, scandium-45 makes up absolutely 100% of all the scandium. That's an easy one. I like, I like it when they're easy. S makes the slide a lot easier to, to produce. There are radioactive isotopes of scandium as well, um, and some of them have a little bit longer half-lives. They can hang around for a little bit. The most stable is scandium-46, one neutron more than the, one the stable one. That has a half-life of 83.8 days, and then you go up a little bit to scandium-47, and the half-life goes down. It's a little more unstable, 3.35 days, and scandium-48, a little less stable than that, only 43 hours, and going the other direction, scandium-44 has a half-life of only four hours, and all the other ones, all other 20 isotopes of scandium are less than four hours. What else can we say about scandium? Oh, it's density. Well, there's the density of scandium. It's about 2.985 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, you know, water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter, which means scandium would sink in water. But you'll notice that it's, uh, if we look down here, it's uh, denser than magnesium, which is 1 gram, 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. And it matches out pretty well with aluminum. So aluminum at 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter is about the same density as scandium. So if you had a brick of scandium, here's a brick of aluminum. A brick of scandium this size would weigh about the same, just a little bit more, not much more.
So you can come up and use the uh, use the aluminum block as a as a substitute because I don't have a block of scandium that large. We'll get to why in just a moment. <coughs> Speaking of density, if you want to come up and try these things, by the way, I have a lot of different blocks here that are all pretty much all the same size, mostly. Um, we're working on getting them all the same size anyway. So here we have uh, blocks of um, maple and plastic, magnesium. Oh, let's go the other way. Tungsten and lead and copper and iron and titanium and aluminum and magnesium. And there's scandium. So scandium, you can see there is just, it's pretty low density compared to a lot of elements. Tungsten way up here, by the way, is just about the densest thing that I can afford to have on the table here. And uh, if you come up after and if you try to lift this block of tungsten, um, be careful. Uh, you can get your fingers under it because I put some feet on it. But if you try to lift it, don't drop it on your toe. It'll leave a mark. This is about exactly, it's almost exactly the same density as gold, by the way. So if you want to know how lifting, what lifting a gold brick would feel like, come up and lift the tungsten. It's almost within, a, within hundredths of a gram per cubic centimeter, the same density as gold. So check that out. So um, I wanted to check out how much scandium would cost. Scandium is about $240 a gram. Gold is only $41 a gram. So scandium is vastly more expensive than gold, about six and a half times as expensive as gold. So this little tiny chunk of scandium here is actually worth quite a bit of money. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the density of scandium in gold, let's just take a look at that. Scandium is about, well, gold is about six and a half times as dense as scandium, which means that if I had a block of gold and a block of scandium, they would both be worth about the same amount of money. And if they were this size, they would be worth about $100,000. So that's why I don't have a block of scandium here for you. Chemically speaking, it has three electrons in its outer shell, so it has that valence of three. Um, so it kind of acts like uh, uh, elements like boron and things like that. Uh, it's a fairly large atom because it has those three electrons waving outside, waving out uh, on the outer edges. Here's its size compared to hydrogen. It's 184 picometers across. Picometer is a millionth of a mi millionth of a meter. Very small. Uh, it does, we already looked at the spectrum of uh, scandium. It has a unique spectrum, but nothing... Uh, nothing that stands out in that spectrum, although that spectrum is uh, important in one of, th one of the only products that scandium is used in, which we'll get to right now. One of the products, not the spectrum one, is an alloy, they alloy scandium with aluminum. And what that does is it um, makes it, when you weld it, the weld, which is right here, this is with scandium, compared to the weld without scandium, the crystals you see are much larger over here than they are over here, which means that um, it's a much stronger weld. So scandium aluminum is a stronger form of aluminum. However, you have to add $200 a gram scandium to the aluminum, which makes the aluminum rather expensive. So that aluminum costs about $100 a kilogram. So it's, it's expensive aluminum. However, uh, it's not too expensive to use in military uses. So here's uh, a jet that's made of uh, scandium aluminum. It's a MiG-29. Um, and these were not, by the way, these al alloys were not even developed until the 70s. So really, scandium was an uh, element without a cause until the 70s. Um, it's the really the only major application of scandium. So. I've heard that it's used in baseball bats. I found online scandium baseball bats. They're all made in China, so I'm never quite sure where the scandium is, just not the brand name. And also bicycle frames, because it does increase the uh, weld strength on the aluminum. So bicycle frames are another natural place where you want a light element that uh, is strong, although that would make a really, really expensive bicycle frame. The last use that I know of is in um, 
high intensity discharge lamps, metal halide lamps. And they add a little scandium into this little capsule here. And when they pass a, a current through this, you get a very, very white daylight color from this. And that's because of some of the spectral lines that scandium contributes to the light that this lamp puts out. So that is basically all the applications we have of scandium. Uh, I forgot to mention at the top here, um, I forgot to mention our, our blatant commercial products. We do have, it's a little late to buy calendars in the year, I know, but we do have a Everything Matters Tales from the Periodic Table calendar in two sizes. And one of my favorite books also, by the way, if you're interested in elements, one of my favorite books by uh, Theo Gray called uh, the Elements is uh, really a wonderful, wonderful book. Beautiful photography. You've seen some of it here. Um, and it's, uh, we of course, available in our store. He also has posters and cards and placemats and puzzles and things like that. But and he also has a wonderful website, periodictable.com. I encourage, that's free. I encourage everybody to go to that. He has a great iPad app as well. He's a really, really good uh, Really good guy. So check that out. Um, wonderful book. He also has a book on molecules as well. Uh, that's all I have. Next, um, next month for us, we're going to shift up one more element. Element number 22. We're going to do titanium, and that's going to be on May 18th at 8 p.m. Also uh, coming up this Sunday at 1 and 3, and next Thursday night at 8, we do, I do another talk called Full Spectrum Science, and this month we're going to talk about mirrors. So we hope that you'll uh, come and see those as well.